Thanks. Okay. So, pleasure to be able to speak to you tonight. Been coming to Pi Data for a few years now, and it's nice to be able to contribute something back. So I thought I'd begin with the question of why. For some of us, it's kind of obvious, but for others, it's questioned. Maybe we should just accept machine learning as a black box and just get on with it. I think your background may help to explain your point of view. Uh, for those of us that have worked in software engineering of one form or another, uh, being able to provide reasons to other people is absolutely crucial. How can anybody trust what you're doing? When, the, when they have questions, what answers can you give? Well, that's just the way that it works. As machine learning finds its place in healthcare and other very delicate and sensitive areas, that probably highlights the reason why we need to have some kind of answer. But there are other reasons. As a software engineer, when you're there in the evening trying to figure out why something isn't working, you're left <laughs> with the question of why. We can't escape it. So if we're putting machine learning in to help maybe with a decision support system, we have to face it. And even indeed, as humans, we have an epistemic, in other words, a basic knowledge-seeking drive. It's also in the motivation, is it relevant? Am I wasting my time? So this brings me to this term, which uh, maybe we can have a show of hands. Who is familiar with this term, hermeneutics? Not many. Well, don't worry. <laughs> There's an enormous amount of baggage attached to it, which we don't need to be interested in. But it's just the idea that interpretation itself uh, is effectively subject to interpretation. But it's a studied field. So there are a few principles that I'd like to draw out, and then we'll, maybe we'll see how they relate to understanding machine learning. The first one is that uh, if it's not something we immediately recognize, then it's necessary to have, if you like, more than one pass at the subject, whether that's a text or whether it's data. So exploratory data analysis, anybody? You know, by getting conversant, almost a dialogue with the data, we begin to understand more. There's also an idea there that we need to compare the particular with the general, or the local and the global are the sort of terms that are floating around the machine learning community, the prediction and the model. And by looking at both, that's where we get the best understanding, rather than maybe just focusing in the past on model level explanation, or as is very trendy at the moment, prediction level. Both play a role. There's also an idea in hermeneutics of, uh, fancily called, a fusion of horizons. Basically, that you can bring multiple points of view to bear, and by combining them, then you get an enhanced understanding. It's pretty basic, really, as an idea, but sometimes it can be missed over when people are just looking at things in maybe hard statistical terms and haven't given thought to multiple points of view. So there's this idea that you go through a spiral where you're comparing detail and then backing out and thinking, well, how does this relate to the whole? And that you integrate context to really be effective because uh, anything by itself can mean almost anything. But pulling it into a context, that's where you start to pin it down. And that leads to real understanding. So let's focus on machine learning, interpretable machine learning. We've kind of got these two hopefully in mind, that there's the global, which just means the model, and then there's the local, which is the individual prediction. So if a, do if a doctor was to say to you, your model, why is it predicting that there is cancer in this person, this person, this set of data, rather than how does this model as a whole predict cancer? That's the kind of idea. There's a lot of papers being written and debate but hopefully we can get past this about these terms. Interpretability leaning more to just understanding and explainability about really how would you communicate that to someone. Now, who that someone is is critical. If that someone is a data scientist, then you can come at them with a whole ream of <laughs> technical information. If that person is a domain expert, there's another perhaps perspective as to what's technical if that's a problem relating to structures, or if it's relating to finance. Again, domain expertise. But if it's, if you like, a layperson, 
who is just maybe a subject that's being affected by machine learning, then it's why have you been turned out for your mobile phone application? Why can't you get the credit for the contract? Uh, they don't want to hear about area under the curve. <laughs> Simple reason codes um, is really what we're looking for. So audience is crucial in this whole process. And that's what hermeneutics, um, one of the things they looked at is that the audience is important. Who has heard of this line? Hands up. So maybe a quarter of the audience. Who has actually installed it and tried to use it? Almost as many, but not quite. And that's probably the best known of the uh, <laughs> interpretability, explainability approaches. Now, Lime was a great, great, great breakthrough a couple of years ago. And it's really this idea that you can fit a nice linear model, fit the line, in actually a very complicated model space because you fit lots of little ones. So Lime takes us forward. Its focus is on the local, the individual prediction. Why is this prediction being made? Uh, now, a term is used that it's agnostic, it's model agnostic. In other words, uh, in principle at least, we can use it with a gradient boosted tree, you can use it with a random forest, you can use it with a neural network, with a variety of models. That's the idea at least. How does it work? Well, I'll just try to summarize the basic idea is that it's a model on a model in as much as it looks at the inputs going into the complex model and the outputs, and from that tries to do, create a simpler model. Does this by perturbing the data, fitting that, and then that becomes effectively your coefficients. And the beauty of it is this, just a few lines of code and we're getting somewhere. This is the Boston uh, data set that you might recognize and it's showing us there that LSTAT is making a large difference on this particular prediction. So if you know what LSTAT is, you've got some insight straight away. We're beyond the black box. <laughs> However, it's been derived because Lime has made this sort of linear assumption around it. So that's great. But there are some problems. They always are, aren't they? And these come down to a few areas. One is, of course, that in this model that's complicated, and we're drawing our little lines through it, sometimes even at the detail level, they're not linear at all. <laughs> you can have some very crazy sort of boundaries in the decision space. So, there are issues with how wide that little kernel is that it's using to try and establish where the boundary is. So some researchers have gone in and they found some very contradictory ideas by digging through. So Lime is great, but it comes with a caution. There's also the thought that a, a linear model is never going to be too good by itself in modeling the feature interactions, which often lead to the complexity. There's also a question about how in practice, you know, how long it takes. So if you're looking for a real-time application um, where you're down to milliseconds of response time, your engineers may have a challenge on their hands. There are approaches where you can engineer it. H2O have done that by establishing the k-means um, towards the Lime predictions. One good thing about Lime is the fact that it, because it's an, another model by itself, it also has got some probability of its prediction. So you've got the, um, usually, a probability of your complex model. So it says about this 80% certain. And then Lime can come along and say, well, I'm 70% certain about my prediction, which a lot of approaches don't have. But that should be a warning, because then there's all that uncertainty effectively there, which could be misleading you. So already Lime is being packaged into commercial products and so on. It's a little bit fearful if they're going to be passed on to people in the GDPR scenario of this is the answer. When in fact, unless they highlight the uncertainty, it may not be the answer. So Lime is good, but there are caveats. What else is there? I wanted to draw attention to this package. Been a bit problematic getting it to run, but that's largely because it draws in a lot of other packages, even out, it would seem, to R. <laughs> it's pulling those in. And what it's trying to do is not just give you just Lime, which uh, Eli 5 does, and as I said, quite a few other ones, but also some other approaches. So one of them is that it can create a surrogate decision tree. So again, we're building a model based on a complex model, but in this case, it's a tree. Now trees, as we know, are kind of up to a point, inherently interpretable. Everybody can generally think about how there's splits around questions, and that uh, the more important ones hopefully come first, and then you make your way through. 
So here's just a text representation, again, I think this is Boston, of how that could work. This may not be very good for the layperson, but for somebody with some technical understanding of their subject, this might be quite good. It gives them quite a bit of information about what was more important and how the combinations sort of build along. And it can work with regression. And unlike this laptop, it can also work with classification. Here we are. We've lost the slide. But there was just another tree showing that it can do that. Skater also has this other feature that it can try and generate a Bayesian rules list around uh, a subject. So this is a very different approach. But what you can see there, I think this is Titanic probably, is that it's going through and building, based on its assessment of the data, a series of rules again. So again, it's a fairly interpretable approach, assuming the rules list is not crazily long but certainly a lot better than, well, this is a black box and you just have to take it as on trust. So Skater offers a few possibilities if you can get through the install process. This, I popped this slide in just to show um, that these models, this is the uh, Bayesian rules list approach, they're not necessarily um, greatly inferior to complex approaches. So at least from a statistical point of view here, you've got your area under the curve and the random forest and the Bayes rule, Bayesian rule list are actually quite comparable. So that maybe changes some of our assumptions around some of these other approaches. And we'll look at one or two more as we go. Now, Shap, who's heard of this one? OK, so almost as many as Lyme. And that's kind of what I've been finding talking to people over the last year or so. So I found this last year. And at the time, it was quite limited. But um, Slunberg, the developer in University of Washington, I think, has been very busy. And he's been adding a number of um, approximations to SHAP um, to make it work. So Shapley values come, amazingly enough, from game theory. And it's all about the idea that you can have groups working together and you need to find a way to pay off appropriately. And it's basically done in the mathematical way by assessing all of the groups and then working out all the possibilities and then saying, across all of those, this is your feature contribution. So this is actually pulled in to features in a machine learning sense. And there are theoretical guarantees, but as with all of these things, I'm not sure they're quite what they seem. So that's why I put in the line at the bottom. I've not tested this in, in practice, but I'm fairly sure that if you've got a lot of highly correlated data, then it's going to end up sharing that um, payoff <laughs> between lots of features. So kind of skewing. So if you've done some preceding feature selection, then you use SHAP, that could probably well lead to quite an accurate result. And SHAP can do many things. As I said, basically, SHAP is actually several different little products under the hood. This is focusing on the tree SHAP. Because Shapley values themselves are highly expensive to compute and basically uh, would have to be disregarded. So what the researchers have done have come up with useful approximations in the classic mathematical way. So here we see at the top an individual, so the local prediction, and you see it's nicely broken down. You can see what's driving it one way and what's driving it the other. And by using the width there, you can see that what's the more important. So in terms of, um, this is the adult census, I think, what's actually driving it in this instance is the relationship to not in family. So that's looking at it as an individual. But criticism of looking at individual predictions is starting to build up now as people realize that it's not necessarily very representative. It helps you with the individual one. But let's say from a regulatory point of view, you want to view the whole thing. How well does this system work? And for that, you need a bit more. So this uh, looks here at the first thousand of these predictions and sort of turns the thing on its side. And you get to see visually an idea of what's contributing. And then you can dig into the details. So very good. In addition to that, by just averaging up the whole lot, you get a global interpretability score in terms of feature uh, contributions. So basically, for no extra cost, you've got local and global. I put this slide in just to highlight something that uh, the author of this package uh, drew attention to recently in a blog post. And that's that uh, traditional feature importance methods that are available in just certain um, methods, like, uh, say, a random forest, or in this case, a gradient boosted tree, where there is a feature importance kind of can give you a false security. 
that you can interpret your model. I mean, maybe you've done this in the past. You've worked through, and you just have a quick look at the feature importances. But actually, when you look at those side by side, you realize they're all different, depending on what metric you use. So how reliable are they? So because he's promoting SHAP, he's just drawing attention that, in theory, the Shapley values, assuming the caveats we spoke before, are more consistent and will give you something like a truer set of global feature contributions. So something to bear in mind. If you've been just going with your Gini scores, <laughs> there's a bit more to it. Uh, and nicely, in the package, you can even start to see these things together in a single plot. So here you've got the global perspective, but by using um, the, the width and also the, the density of the dots, you begin to see, for instance, that the capital gain skews things because it's very important in sum. But actually, relationship wins out because there's more data clumped to it. So it maybe has less effect in the individual predictions, but overall, the aggregate value is there. So very simple. You see one line of code, you've got that insight. So SHAP's probably a package to really investigate. And here's a nice thing. If you're running the most recent versions of these libraries, the uh, developers have included it. They can see the value of these Shapley values, or at least the tree approximation of them. This is something that's coming to the fore a bit more, as, again, people outside of traditional machine learning are starting to give their perspectives. And um, in the whole sort of Bayesian world of prediction is the thought of causality. And they say, well, really, you should take account of the counterfactual. So I found this recently, uh, I guess more of a development idea that somebody's put together called contrastive explanation, where you have the fact and the foil. And it just reminded me of this saying that I've come across in the past. This is a teacher of maybe a couple of hundred years, 300 years ago, who made this point that basically it's understanding the differences between things is when you really know them. If you can't tell the difference, you don't know them. So what it's able to do is look at this individual prediction and say it's this instead of this, and then give it reasons. So to the domain expert, who's got that kind of implicit knowledge, this could be quite meaningful, because the doctor knows that you've got a fine gradient, and maybe this might convince him, yes, I'll go ahead. So this is one to look out for. And there's a, a, a nice paper that's been recently uh, produced. This is another package that I came across recently that can help us with global contributions. Um, I think it's by greedy approximation that it works it out. But ultimately, you get the global picture. And again, with this, this, this was only about 10 lines of code. It was able to give us a breakdown of what's really important. And it's good to see that LSTAT <laughs> confirms what we saw before. So it's another package. And because of this thought in, in hermeneutics about the need to have different perspectives and see, do they agree? How much have we got in common? Are, are we missing something over here? This could be another useful tool. Rule fit is a completely different approach. This is trying to build a model that's interpretable rather than just add it on afterwards, as we saw with these other methods. Um, so it does this by, first of all, working off the standard features, adding in some more through generating decision trees, and then from that, trying to work out the interactions. Because again, we're back to that problem that the linear model's great, but it doesn't really know interactions. But rule fit tries to take you beyond that. The package I've found is not very well documented, but the idea is very powerful because you can get high, I've seen a comparison, I think, with the R version, where it was kind of comparable to random forest, at least with certain data sets. So this could be very useful, not only to give um, post hoc interpretability, but actually a whole model maybe, that maybe you could do more rigorous testing on. And as you can see, again, it's not much code. The one thing I did notice, a huge number of rules were created. So that would probably require some post-processing to see which are the really important ones. I just picked out a couple that stood out from the list. Elstat again. There are, there are many more packages, often driven by uh, papers that you can find on archive. Some new, some old. Non-conformist is related to the conformal prediction idea from robust statistics. And already that's starting to be used in some places. It's a bit more complicated, but um, seems to offer some good guarantees. Law is this, uh, another approach toward local explanations, but looking at a more of a region level rather than the individual or the global. And L2X is um, an information theoretic. So it's looking at mutual information and working out how that can help us to see what's the more important parts. 
And if you know about, um, I think it's variational bottleneck and all of that stuff, th there's plenty more. I had a chat with Matt Dillon the other day. And anyway, there are many approaches, many, many potential views in how to interpret. Another thing just to mention briefly, XG Boost because it has it, is this idea of monotonicity. What is it? Well, this simple diagram tries to capture it. The linear model makes its average trend. The complex model tries to fit all of the data, including the noise. But actually, sometimes you just want a simpler representation. So for instance, if the likelihood is on the Y scale, and say distance is on the X, then you don't really want it to go up as that goes further away. That's just noise. So a monotonic model can be quite useful for something like that. That brings me to deep networks, all the rage, of course. And here also, this idea is being exploited. So this is a library that's recently been released, TensorFlow Lattice, that applies it in a neural network context. I mean, there's so much stuff in the neural network area. I've just picked out a few here. that explore very different ideas but on how to open those boxes. <laughs> So this sort of media storm about these things are unreachable actually is not really true. There's a lot that can be drawn out. So this is an idea, if you're interested in this space, to go and research. There are tons of papers that basically come back to this thought. And it's distinguishing saliency with gradients and sensitivity, which are probably is a bit more related to just perturbing inputs, from a really more important concept, which is relevance. Because just because something changes doesn't mean that that's actually the important thing. So read away. <laughs> there's plenty on this. And, and there's actually some stuff on GitHub that you'll find exploring it, including, just to go back, that investigate is where somebody's actually tried to put several approaches together. Because you can read all these papers and be no wiser at the end of it. But that's a fairly useful um, project that someone's done. So just to mention in passing, our primary channel of information is, of course, if we have sight, our eyes. And there are some great tools appearing and being developed. So you've probably heard of these. These familiar? Partial dependence plot? No, not really. Just a few hands. Well, that gives you the average. But you really need to see it with this other one, the individual conditional expectation. And then you can see how the different ones relate. And if they're crisscrossing, you know, criss then you've got a problem. A bit deeper, uh, yellow brick. I think Ian has highlighted this in the past. But it's developing at an amazing rate. There's all kinds of uh, visualizations in there. Some of the data, some of the model. Um, but I'd also just like to call out this Kepler mapper, which is bringing something from topological data analysis. Far too complicated to talk about here, but might be worth, particularly if you're concerned that in a transformation you're losing the real structure and relationship, because this is a, a much more kind of elastic approach. Just to mention R, even in a Py Python meetup, <laughs> because there's some very interesting things in R. I mean, there's lots, obviously, because of the academic links. But fast and frugal trees, I got onto this through um, the professor at Southampton, Konstantinos, did a presentation about basically sometimes we are choosing the wrong kinds of models. And sometimes a simple model can be just as good, literally almost from a theoretic point of view. And there's also this Gamsel one, which I think goes back to Hasty. A great kind of practitioner product is this Daleks, continuing the Doctor Who reference, <laughs> um, which has got lots and lots of plots, some of them that can actually go beyond partial dependence and individual conditional expectation, such as the ones mentioned there. So if you're really interested in just trying to get a visual grip on your data, have a look. One more thing. Isn't this all too much? We've got, we haven't got time for what we've got to do now. Well, Google have just released this what if tool that tries to draw together a lot of these ideas. And if you're not so hot in your coding skills, you can actually do this through a user interface. So exploring your data, exploring your model, very interesting. I'd say it's worth a look. So what have we looked at? Well, first of all, try to combine multiple techniques. I think we all tend to look for the one magic technique when actually what we should be doing is seeing which group maybe I should use a, a surrogate tree and then explore the details with some plots. So I'm getting the global and the local and getting that deeper understanding. And also, don't expect to do it in one go. Again, we want the quick answer. <laughs> but hermeneutic principles to think about. And of course, we've just really talked about models, but interpretability, particularly from a regulatory point of view, could look at the whole pipeline. And is, a, is there provenance and so on. And just to come back to the thought that a lot of these packages, 
they're not really prime time yet. <laughs> they're great efforts and they're to be applauded and supported, but you might, um, well, your mileage may vary. <laughs> so have a look and see whether maybe more needs to be done. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dean. We've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, push the button. Hello there. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, one thing that I've been really interested in recently and something I've been using a lot is essentially really deep ensemble models to be able to essentially increase the accuracy by just having lots of generative models. Um, with these different techniques, which libraries do you think work best with ensemble models, stuff like StackTrace and stuff like that? StackNet, sorry, and all those different things. Lime, because of its ignorance, its agnosticism, generally will work with most things, but take it with a pinch of salt, what you're getting out. Shapley, if it's a tree-based ensemble, might be quite useful for you. So I don't think ensembles are necessarily ruled out. Do we have another question? Okay, I've seen uh, examples of uh, adversarial attacks, particularly in the computer vision field. And so you can add a, an imperceptible amount of noise to a picture of a panda and the classifier thinks it's a given. Would these be um, useful for, these tools be useful for understanding how these adversarial attacks are uh, disturbing the system and what could be done to make the systems, the models more robust? Well, I'd say there's a strong overlap in the research community because it's that probabilistic kind of where is my border issue <laughs> that feeds into both. That suddenly there's a, you know, you've fallen off the manifold into another area. And it, the same thing can happen with the, the classification. So I know research is definitely driving at that to try and make it uh, more robust, sometimes by including both techniques at once. But I'd say a lot of it is still at that kind of research paper stage. But it's probably going to um, develop as to how a model is interpretable and robust. One more question. Uh, from a regula regulation perspective, have you seen uh, any of these techniques um, kind of have a favourable or unfavourable reaction when talking, being spoken about in a regulatory context? Well, I haven't really got first-hand um, experience, but I know when I went to a conference where it was discussed in some detail, apparently the output that's already provided it can be quite a technical kind of dump that's being done with the existing modeling. Um, so the requirements, I think uh, there's so much to be established there <laughs> that probably the safest approach is to provide the most, again, multiple models and let the experts decide rather than trusting that the model, you know, the, the machine learning model is somehow magically correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I think we'll wrap up uh, Dean's talk then. We can move on to the lightnings. Please thank Dean.